All right, successful stewardship, taking good care of God's money. This is lesson number three in that series. And this lesson is entitled, A Practical Plan for Generous Giving. So before I get into tonight's lesson, I, I, I want us to understand that the idea of stewardship in the Bible is not just another word for giving money. It seems that if the preacher starts to talk about stewardship, everybody's thinking, uh-oh, we're getting a, you know, we got to give more money type sermon. But the, the topic of stewardship is a much broader uh, topic. To be a steward means to have a position of responsibility or to be a good manager of someone else's goods as well as your own. Uh, a good steward knows how to handle money, his own money, as well as someone else's money. So in our last couple of lessons, we have reviewed the motivation for giving, as well as the manner in which we give. In other words, what does the Bible say to us about giving, especially in the New Testament? So today, um, I'd like to examine how we, as good stewards, that's what we are as Christians, stewards of God's blessings. How are we to plan for the various opportunities that God regularly places before us in order to challenge our giving? As stewards, we're here to give what God has given us, to distribute it. So how do we prepare for that? So if you're a vice president, or if you're a manager in a company, or if you're a supervisor at a plant, or a, a federal or a state agency, and your superior calls you in and he lays before you a job or a contract, a goal, an objective, what will be your response? Well, if you're a contractor or if you're an independent businessman, if you're a tradesman or if you're one who provides a service of some kind and you're faced with a new job, a new client or a class, how do you respond? Do you pout? <laughs> do you stamp your feet? Do you groan and complain and try to find a way to avoid the task? Uh, not if you want to be a supervisor for very long. <laughs> it's not the way to, to uh, you know, when, when the big boss calls in the, you know, the middle managers and says, all right, we have a plan, we have uh, objectives. Uh, he or she, whoever it is, doesn't want to hear whining and moaning at that meeting. If you're a manager, a businessman, a VP, or one responsible, you know that you didn't get where you're at by having that kind of attitude towards a new challenge. So uh, stewards are God's VPs. They're God's managers. They're his supervisors who maintain and distribute his resources. Now the difference between the world and the church is that in the church, everyone's a steward not just a few in the world, only a few get to be the boss, get to be you know, supervisors. So when God presents us with a challenge or a goal or an objective or a job to do, we need to respond like good stewards, not bad ones who complain or try to duck the responsibility or who go ahead but with a sigh or a negative attitude in a word, a man or a woman of little faith, a good steward, a good and faithful servant will see the task ahead or the challenge or the call and will respond with a willingness to serve and a desire to succeed in the service to the Lord. I mean, that's a long way around of saying, you know, good stewards respond positively when God brings about a challenge in their lives. It's not always a challenge about money sometimes. All of a sudden the challenge is taking care of someone in the family who is ill or who is incapacitated. Maybe that's the challenge. You know, it's not always about money. We're stewards of God's, uh, the energy and the ability that he gives us to serve. We're stewards of that. Just how much energy and ability that I invest in serving someone else, whether it be in my family or in my church family, that's part of stewardship as well. Now, as far as our various projects are concerned, the objective 
has not been simply you know, here in Choctaw trying to raise money you know, to pay for the stuff that we've done recently. The objective has been to encourage each and every steward, in other words, each person in the church to give generously so we could you know, meet the demand. I mean, just throwing out a big number is too impersonal. It seems you know, too far away um, as, a, as an objective for one single individual. This is why the objective for each one of us is a little more personal. The challenge, the objectives, the goal in our giving is that each one of us give more generously than we have in the past, regardless if there's a project or not. We're continually asked by God to step up, to step forward, not to please the elders or you know, to give money so the preachers can you know, dream up projects. You know, part of our faith is learning to live on what we have left after we've given the Lord a generous portion. So in order to reach these individual goals, to, to break the psychological or spiritual barriers that we have, we need a steward's plan for generous giving. And that plan requires that each of us do three things. So if you want to, if you're saying to yourself, I do want to be a, a generous steward and I want to be generous in my stewardship of what God has given me. Again, not just money, but energy, talent, time. Some people retire and they figure, you know, well, I'm retired, I got nothing to do now. Well, wow, you know, you're retired. You mean, that means that God has kept you alive long enough and healthy so that you now have some time to offer to him that you didn't have before. Because before you had to take care of children at home or you had a job or you had a career or you had a business or whatever. And now you know that, that that's not there anymore. That retirement time, you know, the biggest mistake that people make is saying, oh, it's me time. It's kingdom time. It's not me time. So if we want to grow in this area of stewardship, a couple of things we need to do, okay? Number one, we need to think like godly stewards. Right mindset. We need to understand how things work in the kingdom when it comes to wealth. We need to learn how to think and see things like one who is a steward in the Lord's church. For example, we need to realize that God owns everything and what we have, we have because of Him, whether we're rich or poor. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. I love that verse. He provides us with all things to enjoy. Today, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on vacation <laughs> this week and next week. Uh, and um, uh, today, I remember uh, just in the late afternoon, I had a quiet moment to just you know, read my Bible a bit and just think about things and pray and you know, usual quiet time. Um, and I was struck with all the things that the Lord had provided me today that I enjoyed. Every single thing was for my enjoyment today. I didn't have to have the alarm clock go off. I didn't have to be anywhere at a certain time. I could just sleep in. Well, sleeping in you know, is relative, but still, you know, the thing I don't like is the alarm clock going off. Well, the day started off well. I didn't have to rush breakfast. I could just sit there and have my breakfast, not rush. And then I had all kinds of things to do today that were simple, but enjoyable. I got to go in my garage and tinker around, you know, straighten up stuff, sort the screws with the screws and the bolts with the bolts and the, you know, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. I got to do that. And Lise came home, she had things and she made lunch. 
I wasn't sitting at my desk in the, in the cave, in the bat cave, uh, or what we call the studio, <laughs> having a protein drink and a yogurt. No, Lee's made my lunch. And then the highlight, my afternoon nap. <laughs> yeah, a little nap. And then after that, yeah, some yard work, clean up stuff, everything looks good, the, 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 the grass looks great. Some of you young people are going, what is he talking about? But you got, you people, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and this passage right here, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. We have this idea you know, that God, what he provides is you know, uh, time on your knees for prayer, uh, time sitting in church, listening to sermons. You know, it's all stuff that's hard to do and so on and so forth. We don't realize that all the stuff that we enjoy, and it could be something completely different from, for you guys, but all the stuff that I actually enjoy doing, God provided for me today. And there was no like a deal you do this, but then after comes some hard work and you've got to be on your knees to pray. No, there was none of that. I ate a great supper, food that I enjoyed that my lovely wife prepared once again. Looked forward to being with the brethren uh, tonight. Uh, got some TV stuff to watch tonight that both Lisa and I uh, like to do. All the things in my day were all things that I enjoyed doing. Now it's not like that every day, right? It's not, it's not. But if we understood that God not only provides us with these things, He wants us to enjoy these things. Have you ever thought that almost everything in life, all good things are all to be enjoyed? God created us in such a way with eyes and ears, you know, to hear things, to smell things, to taste things, to touch things, to experience things that are enjoyable. Sunsets and sunrises and a nice cold glass of water and a sunny day and the beach and whatever, you know, all these things, they're simply there to enjoy. It's the world that takes things and tells you, oh, if you do this, you know, this nasty thing or this disobedient thing, you'll really get to enjoy something. But we all know that that's not true. There's a moment of joy. There's always a, a season of happiness or enjoyment for sin, but we always, know, we always know that that always turns badly after. But the things that God gives us to enjoy, we can enjoy them without, without limit. And so what does this have to do with stewardships? A stewardship, stewards understand that all the riches that they have that God has given them are there to be enjoyed. One step further, however, in addition to all the stuff that God gives us that we enjoy, what he gives us to share with other people also brings us enjoyment, also brings us joy, also brings us satisfaction, deep satisfaction that has no aftertaste. So we need to realize that God owns everything, yes, and what we have, we have it because of Him, whether we're rich or poor, but whatever we have, we have it for our enjoyment. All the things that I mentioned in my day, you don't have to be a millionaire to enjoy the things that I've spoken of. Our role as stewards is to manage what he has provided and, 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 and uh, provided us with and give God the glory with its use. You know, so much of it for the work of the church, so much of it for our use in maintaining Christian homes and families in an unbelieving world, and so much for the maintenance of an orderly society, taxes and so on and so forth, right? 
Steward thinking recognizes that everything belongs to God and God has given us what we have and we distribute it beginning with a portion for God, a portion for our family, a portion for society. That's steward thinking, that's mature thinking. If this is our mindset, we are thinking like stewards and not worldly minded unbelievers because they think differently. They think that all they have or own is a result of their efforts. This is mine, I made it, I, you know, I earned it and it belongs to me. The thing they don't recognize is God is the one that makes your little heart beat and makes your lungs bring you know, the air in and out and so on and so forth. Unbelievers think that their wealth is to be used to purchase their own comfort and security. And understand me now, they think that, that that is what wealth is for. Wealth is for purchasing comfort and security. So the more wealth I have, the more comfort and security I have. That's unbelievers thinking, that's not stewardship thinking. Unbelievers think that giving is a favor they do and not a basic responsibility that they have. So when we begin thinking like stewards, it affects not only our handling of money, but it also affects every aspect of our lives. For example, we gain a new balance and poise when we think like stewards. If our income is down, then as stewards, we trust God and we wait for Him to provide as we serve Him with what we do have, not what we don't have. 2 Corinthians 8, 12. If our income is up, we rejoice and we serve Him faithfully without pride or greed. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. Another example of steward-like thinking. We avoid becoming materialistic as stewards. If we know God is the owner and source, we want to please Him with our management of wealth and not give in to purely selfish desire. As stewards, we are more concerned about getting into overloading debt. You know, some Christians are so in debt for unnecessary or overly expensive things that they have nothing left to serve or glorify God with. That's not a good place to be. We can't use up all of our resources so, to, so that we don't have anything to serve the Lord with. When that happens, we rob ourselves of great opportunities for peace and joy and satisfaction. I mean, we're the losers in that. And steward mentality helps us in the way that we spend our money. Stewards always consider the effect on the kingdom that their lifestyle and purchases are going to have. If we're going to act and give like good stewards of God's blessings, then we have to begin to think like stewards and not be unbelievers who only think of themselves and only think of this world. It's one thing for an unbeliever to act like an unbeliever. I get that. It's quite another thing for a believer to act like an unbeliever. That's very counterproductive for the church and especially for that individual. All right, in our business here, plan for generous giving. So think like a godly steward. Number two, act like a trusted manager. Psychologists tell us that the way to change behavior is to change our thinking, right? So if you begin thinking like a steward, it won't be long before you begin acting like a steward. Our actions as trusted managers will be noticeable because the Bible describes what trusted managers act like. And so our giving will follow the pattern set down by the Bible, the pattern that I explained last week, remember in 1 Corinthians 16, 12, regular giving, not when we feel like it, we don't give when we feel like it, we give regularly. And personal giving, we give. And prepared giving, we think about what we're going to give. And proportional giving, in proportion to what we've received. 
Good stewards are careful about their giving because they know that it is a mark of their stewardship. It's important. Trusted managers will consider the welfare of the church as a personal responsibility. As a minister, I want to tell you, I love when a member says, you know, our church does this thing. And the thing I don't like to hear from a member is, so when's your church going to do this? And I want to say, what do you mean your church? I don't own the church. You think I have shares? <laughs> It's our church. It's our church. True stewards, you know, they have a sense of ownership concerning the church. They feel the burden of responsibility for its well-being and its growth. I'm liking to see uh, the, these young guys who have taken the lead in some of the repairs that we've had done. They've been here at night, they've been here early in the morning, they've checked things out, you know, they've, they've, they've come on Saturday, they've worked all day and then in the evening have come to paint. Why? Save money. Why should we hire a painter and pay him $400 to paint one room? Well, we'll do it. I like that attitude. I like that attitude. They feel a sense of ownership. It's, it's our building, it's our church. We want it to look nice because uh, number one, we, we're way past due that we have you know, a fully handicapped, comfortable, modern facility for many of the folks who need that here. We're way overdue. But also for people who come to visit, you know. Research on you know, church growth things uh, people, uh, the, things, the first things that visitors um, uh, notice and kind of they, they have a mental list there, checking off a mental list, if this maybe is a church they would like to come to. I'd like it to be like a very high-minded type of thinking, but it's not, it's pretty basic stuff. So the first thing that people notice when they come to visit, you ready? Yeah, the bathroom. Why? Because it's the first place they go to in your building. When visitors come, you know, I say, oh, hi, you're new here, you're, you're passing through. No, no, well, you know, I'm Joe's cousin. He invited me. Oh, great, welcome, Joe. Here's some information, blah, blah, blah. Well, the, you know, this is over here, the service is in there, you know, and right away I'll say, and if you need the restroom, just around the corner. Okay, thank you. First place they go. And sometimes the first place they go because maybe they don't even need to use the bathroom. They just want a moment of, I'm in the building. <laughs> I'm here. I'm in enemy territory. I'm with strangers. And they go into the bathroom, you know, and they'll wash their hands and they'll comb their hair, maybe look at the stuff, you know. <sighs> okay, I can do this. It's hard to walk into a place where there are 400 people and you don't know anybody. So the bathroom is a kind of a sanctuary, you know, it's a kind of a safe place. So do you like to, so yeah, the condition of some of our bathrooms several years ago. <laughs> did not recommend us. That's number one for men and women. Number two, well, number two um, uh, are the children's facilities. Because if mama has a couple of kids and she's bringing them to the nursery, if that nursery, the toys are on the floor and they're dirty, especially if she comes back like the second week and that toy that was on the floor is still on the floor a week later, exactly in the same place next to the bacon strip. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't say, what does that say about us? You know, we're not clean, we don't care. I'd like to say they come back for the scintillating preaching. I'd like to say that, but that's not at the top of the list. Now, if those, you know, the bathroom, the parking, the kids' facilities, you know, things are clean and people are friendly, if those things are in line, okay, now I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen to what Marty is saying or Mike or whoever, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm going to listen now because maybe I'll come back the third or fourth week, okay, then the teaching and the preaching and the programs, you know, that kind of, integrates them, but right off the start, it's the very simple things. So to kind of double back to my original point, 
Who takes care of all those little details? Well, the members take care of all those little details. The ones who care, the, one who, the ones who sense, have a sense of, of ownership. So a good steward does not feel that the church belongs to the preacher or to the elders, and they're only visiting. A good steward wants not only uh, financial input, but wants to uh, 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 pull his or her weight in supporting the church. So our little projects, now or in the future, uh, will never succeed unless everyone has a kind of a realistic investment of money and time or service in their final uh, completion. Hopefully financial challenges will transform many of us from being you know, members to being stewards. I want to tell you something. If you've taken out a big chunk of money okay, to contribute to expand the parking, <laughs> and you took out 10K out of your retirement savings or you know, your crazy money and you gave it to the church so you know, they could make their budget to, to put in some new parking, and kids are in the parking lot, you know, uh, playing and digging holes in the parking lot, you're going to be out of your car. Hey, 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 stop that. You can get out of there. Stop doing, why? You're messing with my 10,000 bucks. So if we want to create a steward's plan for generous giving, we have to think like a steward, act like a steward, and then we need to feel like a precious heir. If we understand that our role as steward is preparing us for future blessings, we'll be able to give generously and cheerfully and share the burden for church growth. God doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our help. He could send an angel to do the parking lot. <laughs> a lot faster and a lot cheaper. But he accepts our help because he is trying to teach us and bless us through this activity. So good stewards learn to trust in God and not in themselves, certainly not in material things. You know, there's great joy, as I said before, joy and peace and satisfaction that comes to a person who has learned to trust in God as stewards have to. Um, good stewards become witnesses of God's providence. Only through effective stewardship do we become aware of how God works in our lives and the lives of other people. And this builds our faith. How do you think your faith and hope is built? You go to the gym, you know if you do certain reps of certain exercises, it'll build up your, you know, your thighs or your biceps or your shoulders, whatever. You know, they have exercises for different parts of the body. Well, there are exercises for different parts of the spirit. Giving is a very important spiritual exercise. It builds up the trust muscle, trust in God muscle. It builds up the hope muscle in ways that nothing else will do. Only when you break the barrier do you find out what God can do. When you go to the end of what you can do, then you find out what, what God can do. Good stewards also experience more perfectly and more fully God's grace. When you have totally given up focusing on yourself, spending for yourself, serving for your own needs exclusively, and begin to be God's steward, you will experience His care for you and your life's needs. Because where your strength will end, His will begin. I, I have to spend all of myself first before He spends. Stewards are being prepared for the day when they will sit at the right hand of God to reign with Christ. This is the purpose of their training as stewards. I've told you before, what's the end game of Christianity? That like we go to church? 
Repent and be baptized, your sins will be forgiven, and as a reward, you will be able to go to church three times a week for the next 60 years. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> if that's the deal, forget it. I don't want that deal. No, repent and be baptized, and your sins will be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And when you die, the Holy Spirit will raise your body up and then God will give you a glorified body that will allow you to be in His presence and dimension. And then He will exalt you to the right hand of God so that you will participate in the Godhead. Amen. That's the end game. Is that what you want? Because that's the end game of Christianity. All this business here, going to church, doing our thing, this is the gym, this is the workout place, this is the, you know, this is the work area where we're practicing and developing our spiritual uh, muscles. Why, you say, for heaven? No, for here. I'm developing spiritual muscles because I don't want to get beat up by the devil and killed by him. Because his only goal is to destroy my spirit. That's all he's interested in. I think, wow, I'm 72, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm almost there, you know. Yeah, well, I know a lot of guys my age who, who got taken out by their pride, by their bad habits, finally caught up to them. So all of this here is to keep us faithful so that we can you know, up, glorified, exalted. That, that's what I'm going towards. And the peace or the grace that you taste, that little bit of heaven, you, you just taste it every once in a while, that's just to keep you in the game. That's just to give you a little smell, a little little taste, a little view of what's to come. And when you have that view, when you see that, when, you, when the, 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 the curtain opens and you see, you get it, what we're heading towards, then you're at the point like Peter and Paul and you're able to say, you're going to kill me? Well, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. You'll have to kill me because I know what I know. I know it. I, I don't only just believe it, I know it. So you're just going to have to kill me. I won't like it, you killing me. <laughs> I won't enjoy the torture, but believe me, there's not enough torture in the world that'll make me unbelieve what I already know. So go ahead, take your best shot. See, that's, that's who we are. That's where we're going. We shouldn't grow, we shouldn't groan rather, or weasel out of our stewardship role because we are being prepared for a much greater role in the future. And I wish I could articulate that. I haven't seen it all yet in my study. I know it's there. I know what we're heading for. I'm not quite sure yet. If you've seen it, let me know. They say we're going to judge angels. Uh, they, yeah. My own personal thought, my own personal thought is being within the Godhead will enable us to know God more perfectly than we have ever known Him before. And since God is love, then our eternal existence will be a deepening knowledge of God's love forever. Think of it this way. Do you remember falling in love? You know, those first moments when you realize that you loved the person that you're finally with? And you're on the phone with them at night. Hello, yeah, okay, no, you say goodnight. No, you say goodnight. No, no, you say goodnight. No, no, you say goodnight. You know. Yeah, I just woke Donnie up. You know that moment when you say, oh, wow, she's the best one. Oh, wow, yeah, falling in love. Imagine, imagine that falling in love feeling multiplied a thousand times frozen in time forever. Imagine. Right now, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't exist like that. You know, you, you die from heart failure because <laughs> your body couldn't take it. But the glorified body, it can take as much happiness as God will give it. So stewardship and all the things of stewardship 
simply one of the spiritual exercises that we learn and that we grow through to guarantee that we stay focused and stay to the end. All right, that's lesson three. We move on to lesson four next week. Thank you for your attention.